Good evening. Uh, I'm Molly Rosenberg, Director of the Royal Society of Literature, and I'm so pleased to welcome you to tonight's celebration of CLR James in a partnered event from the Royal Society of Literature, the British Library, NGC Bocas Litfest and Curtis Brown Heritage. Ahead of a special event on James's life and times at Trinidad and Tobago's premier literature festival, the NGC Bocas Litfest, uh, you're joining us this evening to celebrate the work and legacy of pioneering Trinidadian writer, historian and socialist CLR James. In the company of Trin Trinidadian writer Ayana Lloyd Banwo, James's publisher Margaret, Bu Margaret Busby, uh, and James's wife and colleague Selma James, will journey through James's writing life together using three of his most celebrated works as signposts along the way. Minty Alley, Mariners, Renegades and Castaways, and The Black Jacobins. Guiding us this evening, we have the British Library's excellent curator of Caribbean collections, Nicole Rochelle Moore. Nicole Rochelle has led courses on Andrea Levy and Toni Morrison, and worked closely with New Beacon Books and the George Padmore Institute. She co-edited Dream to Change the World on the life of John LaRose and contributed to the recently published In Search of Mamiwata, Narratives and Images of African Water Spirits. Nicole Rochelle, over to you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Molly. Really good to be here. Thank you, Bocas. Thank you, Royal Society of Literature and, of course, the British Library. So tonight we are um, celebrating and discussing CLR James, um, who was born in Carony, Trinidad um, uh, in 1901. And uh, his family, they moved to Tunapuna, which is in the east. And I always, Tunapuna is a place I love more because of the name than the actual place. This is not to um, offend anyone from Tunapuna, but I just love the word Tunapuna, Amerindian name. Um, <clears throat> in uh, 1932, CLR James um, arrived in England and actually stayed with another famous Trinidadian, Mary Constantine, who was to go on a great cricketer and he was to go on to become um, ambassador uh, here uh, for the Trinidad and Tobago. Uh, James, CLR James uh, has, you know, has a kind of prolific body of work. Um, and certainly by the time he came here in 1932, he had already tucked up under his arm um, what would become the novel Minty Alley. Um, and that was published in 1936, but we'll get into that a little later. Uh, he was involved in a number of movements uh, and he was associated with what people describe as other black anti-colonialists of the time. Most uh, uh, clearly George Padmore, they were close colleagues um, and friends. And uh, CLR James is also a, a correspondent for uh, the Manchester Guardian and wrote very um, profoundly on cricket and later on in the 60s was to give us that wonderful, wonderful text beyond a boundary. Um, he left in 1938, he left Britain and moved to the States and he stayed there until 1955. He was in fact, um, he was in fact imprisoned on Ellis Island for um, being subversive. And uh, we'll talk a little bit about that later on as well. He came back to London and then relocated to Trinidad in 1958 on the invitation of uh, the person who would become Trinidad and Tobago's first prime minister, Eric Williams. And then he returned again to England in 1962 maybe a few days before Trinidad and Tobago became independent. And he settled in London for the majority of his remaining years and uh, eventually passed over, as we would say, to the realm of the ancestors in May, 1989. So just a little bit about him, but we will find out more. So with me this evening, we have 
Ayanna Lloyd Banwu, who is a writer from Trinidad and Tobago. She's a graduate of the University of the West Indies and holds an MA in Creative Writing from the University of East Anglia, where she is now a Creative and Critical Writing PhD candidate. Ayanna's work has been published in Moco Magazine, in Small Acts and in Pre, among others, and um, shortlisted for Small Acts Literary Competition and so on. But there's a lot I can say about her, but the thing that I want to really say about her is that we met for the first time last month when she sat in conversation with me at the British Library along with another Trini writer, Anthony Joseph, and we discussed Ayanna's debut novel, The Wonderful, Wonderful, When We Were Birds. So Ayanna lloyd Ban will welcome. Thanks, Next, me. you're very welcome. Next, we have um, a wonderful woman, and someone I regard as a friend, Margaret Busby, major cultural figure here in Britain and indeed around the world, born in Ghana, educated in the UK. She graduated from Bedford College, London University, before becoming, how many times have you heard this line, Margaret Busby? Before becoming Britain's youngest and first black woman publisher when she co-founded Alison and Busby in the late 1960s. At Alison and Busby, she published notable authors, including CLR James, among many others. Um, writer, editor, broadcaster, literary critic, Margaret has written drama for BBC Radio and The Stage. Um, she has interviewed high profile writers, including Toni Morrison, Ngugi Wathiongo, and Ben Okri. She has judged the Booker Prize, among others, and served on the boards of such organizations as the Royal Literary Fund, Tomorrow's Warriors, UBN Jack Community Trust, and the Africa Center in London. Margaret is a long time campaigner for diversity in publishing. She's an honorary fellow of the Royal Society of Literature and a recipient of several honorary doctorates and awards, including the Bocas Henry Swansea Award, the Royal Society of Literature's Benson Medal and the Royal African Society's inaugural Africa Writers Lifetime Achievement Award. Margaret Busby, welcome. And finally, Selma James. Welcome Selma James. Selma is an anti-sexist, anti-racist, and anti-capitalist campaigner. In 1972, she put forward Wages for Housework, WFH, as a political perspective that redefined the working class to include all who work without wages, starting with women, the primary carers everywhere. The international WFH campaign that Selma founded which in fact celebrates its 50th anniversary this year, coordinates the global women's strike. With her husband and colleague, CLR James, she worked in the English speaking Caribbean for independence and federation from 1958 until 1962. Selma James's first anthology, Sex, Race and Class, The Perspective of Winning was published in 2012. Her second, Our Time is Now, Sex, Race, Class and Caring for People and Planet was published in 2021, both by PM press. So there you have it, a stellar lineup, a galaxy of wonderful women. Can I just call you all WW? A wonderful woman here with us tonight. So welcome. Oh. So we're here celebrating CLR James and of course the three works um, cited for this evening are Minty Alley, uh, The Black Jacobins and Mariners, Renegades, and Castaways. Um, but, you know, in an earlier conversation, Margaret and I were chatting, we were saying, well, we can, you know, we can talk about other things. We can talk about other, you know, other texts as well. But let's start <clears throat> first with Minty Ali. Um, do any of you remember sort of like the first time you read Minty Ali? If you, you know, and, and if you did, how how you felt about it, what your feelings were about this novel. Ayana, you want to have a go there with your CLR t-shirt? <laughs> you know, I knew this, I knew this t-shirt was going to get me in trouble. <laughs> I'll tell the yeah. story of this t-shirt um, a little bit later <laughs> if, it, if it comes up. Um, I believe that Minty Ali, the first time I might have read it, 
might have been at school. I'm, I'm trying to think back now. It was one of those books that my grandfather would have had in his collection. You know, you sort of go through and you, you flip through all the books and say, ah, I don't want to read that. You know, there was a point when I was, you know, quite young, you know, I wanted to read R.L. Stein and Christopher Pike and, and, you know, so granddad's serious looking books. And, you know, but it was a book that I think followed me throughout for quite quite a long time because it kept it's like how loveless books keep kind of coming up in your life until you're ready to sit down and read them and I believe I read Minty Ali at school at secondary school the Bishop Hans for the first time it was one of those books that was on our our CXC syllabus they give you this um it's a, a long syllabus of all of the possible books that they would say, okay, you know, you should cover, you should have read between form one and form five. And Minty Ali was one of those books. We did not study it at school, but because I was such a reader, by that time I started looking for more, maybe, maybe I might've been 14 or, or 15, looking um, more, more directly for Caribbean novels. And I, I wanted to read more Caribbean fiction because that simply was not the fiction that would have been on the shelves in, 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 in bookshops, not in not, but your commercial sort of fiction. And I felt like, where, where, where is it? Can't just be at school. And I, I started, you know, looking. And it's one of those texts that you find more and more every time you read it the older you get, the more, I suppose, my political awareness developed. Oh. So much more of, of, of this novel. Um, I saw oh. how much it related with, with, with his other work and, and I'll, I'll stop there. And, um, okay. Anybody else wants to jump in? Selma, Margaret? Well, I read it um, in the early 60s, which was the first time I'd seen a copy uh, they were very scarce indeed. And I knew George Lamming's work, I knew Monday Paul's work, I knew other West Indian writers, Wilson Harris in particular. And this was news to me and I realized very quickly that this was an earlier attempt and I knew it was Nello's um, apprentice hand. He was trying his hand at literature, at, at fiction, and the attempt was very good. And we were very excited when one day we were walking along the street in Port of Spain and he said, that's the nurse. And we, I quickly ran after her and tried to get a glimpse of her, but there was a character from the novel walking in the street in front of me. And I knew all about her because we had discussed it in detail and it was a kind of an amazing experience. I think the book is deceptively deep. Um, he was working out how to do fiction. He was going to be a writer. And he, this was his attempt doing it about fiction as opposed to what he did later, which was theater and history and um, all kinds of journalism. And he was also working out what the class relations were in Trinidad that he had lived through. And he was, in the course of writing the novel, you could see he worked out the relationship and understood at least what the questions were, not the answers, but how people who were educated were going to relate to their country women and men um, and how you write for the public um, so that it is across the board rather than one particular sector. Uh, so I saw the process of uh, CLR's development in the course of reading uh, Minty Alley, I knew what he had done with it at a later point in his life. It was very interesting to me and I made comments as I read it, he was not well and I was in the bed next to his reading the novel. 
and uh, commenting, but Nello, you say this here, what did you mean at that kind of thing? It was fun. Wow. Oh gosh, Margaret, any thoughts? Yeah, I, I can't remember when I first read it. It may have been soon after it was published by John the Rose, which was by New, New Beacon Books, which was in about 1971. But I was very aware that it was probably, the, I think it was the first book to be published in Britain by a, a Black Caribbean person in 1936. And so it, was, it had that sort of importance it, as a landmark, as, as well as the, the vitality of the actual words. And I had the audacity to turn it into a radio drama in 1998 for, for um, BBC, I think it was Radio 4, Radio 3. And it actually won the award, but it, it, it's, it's much better to read it as a novel than to, uh, I haven't listened to my drama for, you know, since 1998, but it was it was a it was a challenge, and it just brought home to me what sort of skill he brought to developing those characters in, in Mintiari. I mean, it's it's um yeah, I don't remember uh, how old I was when I read it, but I was a young woman, and certainly I was reading. Um, yeah, the, the, you know, the one, the edition published by New Beacon Books, which I can't find at the moment. And so the copy that I do have is a first edition from 1936. And I got the impression reading somewhere some time ago that he didn't actually mean to, he didn't really think about having it published. Am I right, Selma? He didn't actually think about having it. He was just kind of, it was like an exercise as Selma has you know, has told us it was an exercise for CLR James in writing fiction. And I think when he sort of mentioned this, um, but Selma, you can correct me here. When he kind of mentioned this, it was it to Mr. Warburg. He was like, what? You've written a novel? Let me see. And he said, oh, well, what do you want to see it for? I don't think he intended at all for this book to be, you know, it was nothing. It was for him. It was nothing more for quite a while than just his exercise. Well, what happened was that his, it was either World Revolution or um, um, Black Jacobins, which was published by Fred Rolberg. And in, Fred said to him, uh, uh, have you written anything else? He said, well, I have, a, I have a novel. He said, let's see it. And they accepted it. But he, you're right, he had not written it for publication and had not mentioned it to the man who had agreed to publish him. Mm. It came out because he thought that he had a good writer in his stock of, of writers. And he was right, but Nello didn't continue along the same vein. He did mm. other things, so we have what he did then. Yes, I mean, he, yeah, he never wrote, I think, you know, there was a sort of promise of another novel, but another novel never actually came forth. And um, <clears throat> it was this, it was that fact, the fact that Minty Ali was the only novel that... But, um, but there was, but in, um, beyond, in Beyond the Boundary, there are sections of Beyond the Boundary which could be fiction mm. in the sense that the story is related in a way that you, you want to know the end and you want to know the beginning and the, the whole thing. It, it is clearly the skill of a novelist that is being displayed in telling the story of the man who was not chosen for the team. Hmm, yeah. I mean, and we could probably say the same thing, maybe we'll, when we speak a little later about the Black Jacobins, because I, I can, <clears throat> in terms of it sometimes reading like a novel, you know, it, it it's history, but anyway, we, we can come to that. But um, yeah, I mean, Minty Ali being then his only sort of published novel, 
in 2014, there was a readathon. You might remember this summer, there was a readathon, there was a 12 hour readathon, CLR James readathon, and it was put on by an organization called World Bites. <clears throat> and, um, and so, I don't know how many of us, I, I kind of represented the George Padmore Institute at the time and so on. And I, by that time was already in love. I had read Minty Ali quite a while before that, but was really in love with it and thought I'm gonna read from Minty Ali. And then turned out to be the only, it was the only, uh, it was the only kind of um, reading of the novel. Everybody else kind of went for, for the other, you know, kind of nonfiction and political and, and so on. But, um, yeah, I think it really holds its own and has such a very special place. And uh, the republication of it, you know, most recently has been very, very welcome. You know, the Penguin republication. I think it's a very important novel, really. He also mm -hmm. wrote short stories, didn't he, Selma? And it would have been and good to know what else he would have done had he considered along the line of fiction. Yes, and I mean, uh, Triumph and one or two others are very striking, and he was encouraged to be writing, but uh, a lot of things happened in the 30s, and one of them was that he got politics, something like people get religion, <laughs> and he hadn't any time, for, his mind was not on that any longer, he was with the world, he, he said that the world became, went political and he went with it. Mm -hmm. And that's absolutely what happened to his, his career as a writer. <laughs> it took mm -hmm. a turn of politics. I think the thing about Minty Ali that, uh, that why I think it remains such, a, such an important work is that I think for, for, for me, in, in retrospect, thinking back on it, you know, there's this sense that you could, do, you know, I don't know how people get this idea that you could somehow divorce, there is narrative or there's characters and there's story and then there's politics and somehow these two things are separate and these two things don't always have anything to do with each other. But, um, you know, you, you, you did say that it's almost as though you can see him working out how in, in, in this in this yard, in this place that is really a sort of a microcosm of uh, of, 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 of working Trinidadians, of, of Indians and Africans in this yard that was almost like a, a testing ground or a, a, a reflection of, okay, this is how the politics, this is how it looks. This is mm -hmm. how ordinary people enact. And, 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 and work through those kind of tensions. There's, there's race, there's class, there's gender. There mm. is the question of, of, of the educated middle-class person who is kind of outside the worlds of the people that he is attempting to, I guess, speak, not speak on behalf of, but the world that he wants to make better for them, but he's not part of that world and it's such a fascinating mm -hmm. outsider insider um perspective that i think um haynes and of course you know we can dispense with saying okay haynes is not clr james but for the purposes of the discussion <laughs> i think you know there's an interesting um dynamic where you can see similarities in the positioning of how haynes is positioned and how clr james also is, is is positioned as well and i think that you know um you were saying somewhere that that the world was doing politics and and you know so he went that was his passion that's where he went but um this is such a political work it, it it's such an intensely political novel as well he had already written on the case for west indian self-government it wasn't that he had been on political before, but um, what he, once he became political, his motivation was different. He was interested in organizing with other people in a way that changed the world uh, uh, in a very fraught time, the 30s. Hitler came to power in 1933 and the Spanish Revolution was bombed 
in 36 in Guernica that Picasso did that famous painting about. So that was a different kind of con connection with politics. That was he himself involved and trying to involve others and working out what to involve people with and for what to have what impact in the world. That was a very different skill and a very different interest and therefore a very different kind of writing. Yes. Yes, um, I, I came across a quote, <clears throat> it was from an, a, an interview that he gave, and, um, and it's about, the, I think the, the interviewer kind of commented on the, <clears throat> on the novel's humanity, and C.L.R. James said, the human aspect of it which surprises so many people is the basic constituent of my political activity and outlook. The day I recognize that my instinctive response to any political situation is not a human one, then I know that my time for retiring has come, since all that I would do afterwards would be bureaucratic and fraught with mischief. And so, you know, that's, that, for me, kind of reading that quote, it's, it's like going back to what Ayana said, it's, it's CLR James kind of saying, well, actually, yeah, this is a political novel. You know, it is a political novel. Um, and yeah, it's a very, a very special, a very special novel. Um, no, I, th I think it's significant that it's dedicated to his mother. Yes, yes, yeah. Hmm. Um, but yes, it's, uh, yeah. Anyway, yeah, I'm just thinking about what what else could have come from him. I don't know if anybody, I have not read La Divina Pastora, the short story um, <clears throat> that he, that was published. Um, he spoke about La Divina Pastora, about La Divina Pastora being published in the Beacon magazine and, and, and also the other short story, Triumph, which I haven't read either, but I, I, you know, have read a, about it and know that again, it kind of, it focuses on people who are seen as like at the, you know, the, the bottom of the economic ladder. Um, and always that kind of, that kind of clear sort of association with, those people, the working classes, even though one of the, I guess one of the critiques of um, Mintiali that I, that I, I came across some time ago was, was just what Ayanna spoke about, the, the kind of middle class person that Haynes is being sort of a little bit apart. But to me, that was a very deliberate, um, it was very deliberate on, on James's part. To, Haynes was always going to be a part and that is, and, and in making him so, that is being very real to, you know, as we say, the kind of uh, the societal milieu, if you like, you know, of, of Trinidad. But, um, but that was seen as a, a kind of, um, by, by one critic anyway, that I read as a kind of uh, a weakness, but I, I didn't, I don't, I don't agree with that. I think in, 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 in this edition, um, I think Kenneth Ramchand's introduction, he says, um, he calls that distance. He said, the, what is, what, what basically is the, the, the use of that distance is to show how that distance impoverishes both, both sides. Yes. The fact that, you know, if, if, if we can't, if we're not intimate with each other, what, what do we lose? So, um, mm. and, and it's just real. So, mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's just real. It is a real you know, that's a, a real thing. There is that distance. Perhaps even more so now in Trinidad, you know, perhaps even more so, mm, but that's a whole right. other, that's a whole <laughs> other, <laughs> that's a whole other evening. Um, and so did, would anybody like to say anything else about Mintiali or can we move on? I think, to... I think it's, just, it's just very clear that he, he was a good observer. Mm. And his observations about the connections between class and community and the ways that we actually all, the things that we share as well as the things that divide us is, is really important. Mm. Selma, I, um, Margaret has reminded me, I'm looking for that little note. I came across something while throwing papers out the other night, <clears throat> getting rid of lots and lots of um, superfluous bits of paper. But I came across um, some notes I made in 2013 um, at the Oval. 
and Margaret has reminded me because Margaret said he was a very good observer and that's what you get from Minty Alley. And Selma, I actually have a quote from you where you say he was a great listener, observer and listener. Um, and you said that in 2013. You, you probably don't remember, but I wrote it down. We were all at the Oval. We were at the Oval celebrating uh, 50 years of Beyond a Boundary. And uh, yeah, so uh, everybody was there talking about CLR and New Beacon Books. My sister Janice Durham and I were womaning a New Beacon Books stall there. So yeah, I was like, well, it, it, it's very. Uh, I don't remember saying it, but it's absolutely mm. <clears throat> what I believe. And what I saw him do, um, he was a, a very engaged in the U.S. and in, in on a day-to-day -day basis in politics. And I saw him sit down with people and ask them questions about their lives and how they did things and what they thought and the rest. And this would go on for a half hour or 45 minutes. And then later he would say, you know, that guy said this and talk about what he heard and ask me what I thought about what I had heard. And he was excited and interested in how people lived and what they thought about their lives and what they were likely to do about it. He was fascinated by that. And therefore he was always an interesting person because he was interested in the people that he spoke with. And therefore they spoke brilliantly because there was a listener. There was someone who was truly interested in their lives and what they thought about it. And you know, most people, don't have that. Most mm. people's lives go on and they are in a way neglected. I mean, people are not respected. You know, the Black Lives Matter movement put its finger deeply on part of our lives, all of our lives, that our lives actually matter. And most of us are not encouraged to believe that. As a matter of fact, we're discouraged to believe that they don't really matter. And that's part of the terrible thing of living in this moment in time, but it's been true for quite a while. And he was one of the people who worked in the opposite direction because he was in the opposite direction. He did mm -hmm. think that each life mattered. He was a true Marxist which is why I really cared about him and why he was such a good political leader in our organization. I learned so much, and I think all of us did, from his approach to what politics was about and how to enhance what we were doing and enhance the relationships with the people we were doing it with. Mm. Thank you so much for that. Yeah. I mean, it's a, it's, it's really, it's a great, um, it's not even a skill. It's a, such a great attribute when attribute. someone is able to, to really listen and to be, um, you know, like fully engaged, you know, in, in, and wanting to find out. And I think he is one of those people, I guess, you know, that, you, you know, there's some people you describe them as, um, when they're talking to you, you feel as though you're the only person in the room, that kind of thing, where they're really deeply engaged with you. And yeah, that would always be, yeah, that would always be a plus. That would always be a plus. But mm. also, he knew what to ask um, because he was hearing what was told to him. And he, the, gen, the fact that he was genuinely interested meant that people told him many profound things that they would not have said otherwise. Right. I've done that constantly. Yeah. 
It's so interesting to hear you say that because, of course, I keep I keep think. I mean, as 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 the, as the novelist, I keep thinking about Minty Ali and thinking about how that that character of Mister Haynes becomes the person that everyone comes and tells their things to. He's the one who you know they they feel like they can come and confide to, and he listens and he takes their 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 their, their challenges seriously. There isn't any looking down in in a very strong way of the the particularly the woman. I think in 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 Minty Ali, I think are so um, are so finely drawn because of that observational quality mm-hmm. and that and that ability to to sort of listen. Um, one of the characters that I think um, I remember <laughs> always feeling so fondly towards is is Maisie, who I think you know mm-hmm. now we talk so respectability politics is like a kind of a buzzword now and you know there's so much that he is able to sort of see in this young woman who is not interested at all in being anybody's good wife or good <laughs> no good, good maybe he gets a bad rap sometimes he gets but, a yeah. bad rap but yeah, you know, yeah now yeah. looking at, at this character this is somebody who was fully invested in being herself and fully mm-hmm. invested in her own um, her ability to, to transcend and, and succeed and not be weighted by these expectations of what her femininity or her womanness or her childness or whatever it is was supposed mm-hmm. to sort of be about. And I can't help but think about that quite a lot in, in that same listener ability that made C.R. James such an excellent politician and organizer and leader. Um, is also what made him an excellent writer, an excellent, um, an observer and crafter of, of people and of characters. Yeah. Maisie is a, yeah, I mean, definitely. Maisie gets a bad rap, like, uh, as you were saying, talking about her now, I'm suddenly thinking of another female protagonist in another novel, um, The Book of Night Woman, Lilith. Lilith gets a bad rap, but it's that same, it's a similar kind of, you know, in, in you know, real investment in being herself yes. and so on. Yeah. Interesting. Interesting. Um, the Johnson Forest tendency, Selma, can you speak to us a little bit about that for people who don't know? Because I didn't really know that much about it. Um, and, and James's uh, kind of, you know, his kind of making of it and his role in it and, uh, you know, the politics around it. Can you tell us a little bit about what that was during his time in the States? Well, um, what CLR did was to go back to what Marx had been, um, what, what Marx had said and what Marx had meant before Stalinism, I'm so sorry, I have to be political, but when the, no uh, when the Soviet revolution was destroyed by Stalinism, what happened is that there was a kind of corruption that entered the left-wing movement. And it was as true in the West Indies, for example, as it was in Europe and in the United States, and in fact, everywhere in the world, because they felt they they had reason to convince us that we needed a vanguard party and that this, this leadership, this vanguard uh, had to lead us in order to win. And the CLR, he said, no, that's not Marxism. And when the cricket season was over, (laughs) he had the whole of the winter and the beginning of the spring before the the bats came out um, to read. And the first time he did that was in 1933 or 34. And he said, these Stalinists are the greatest liars that have ever lived. And he came out against them, that is in his own mind and understanding. And he worked very hard in a number of ways, which it's really too complicated to go into here, to find out what it was we as a movement should be doing Uh, instead of the Vanguard Party, that is, 
how do we organize ourselves if we are socialists and want to change the world for the whole world? That is for the industrial world and for the non-industrial world. How do we do it? How do we organize? And by the 1946 or 47, after a whole number of experiences and also after a reading of Hegel and Lenin and Marx and being in the United States, which was much more conducive to wider thinking, less hidebound than Europe had been in his experience, he began to develop conception or at least began to put forward what Marx had put forward as a conception of when we do join an organization or when we do join a movement for change, what happens to us? How are we dealt with? Are we do, are we dependent on a vanguard to teach us or do we have, do we bring to the movement our own experience and is the organization we form representative of that experience of all the experiences of those of us who join movements to change the world. Mm -hmm. uh, and he developed ways of organizing he said that in every organization, there is a deep a grassroots which really presents itself as a, the abilities to change things, to look at things more deeply, to struggle, to organize, but they are often sat on and repressed. And we have to build an organization that's based on the grassroots and not merely repress it, but find what the leadership should be leading to. That is leadership, real leadership takes you where you want to go, but it has to find out where that is. And this whole relationship was what Nello really did so much work. Uh, I have to say that I was, <clears throat> pardon me, a young move, woman in Johnson Forest, and I really didn't read very much. I had a high school diploma, but no university. By the way, he had no university degree. I have to say that. That's why he speaks so clearly, it seems to me, <laughs> and writes words of one syllable for anybody to understand who is ready to find out. And uh, I used to read none of the documents on the Russian question or the other question, but I read his every speech that he gave, which was transcribed or everything that he wrote about how to build an organization. I was absolutely fascinated by what he was saying. I knew him, of course, he was the leader of an organization that was not big. My sister had worked as his secretary. So I had met him when I was about 13 years old, but he was a very old man then. He was at least 40. You know, <laughs> when you're 13 years old, that's that's very, very ancient. Strange. And uh, And I was truly determined to understand how to build an organization and I come to the right place. This was the man who was himself developing and a highly developed and a brilliant person and a, an educated Marxist. And here I was to find out how to build an organization. And I just, I loved it. I just, I really was, I was really getting the education of my life. You're giving us education right now. And 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 you are. And you know, and I can just I'm feeling that kind of passion and the excitement and in hearing you describe, you know, your experience of, of being part of Johnson Forest and learning from from CLR James. And yeah. he, you know, he I remember um I was about 15 then. That's when I began to be seriously involved with Johnson Forest. And we had a class on 
Negro history. That's what it was called then. But it was really the history of the Civil War and the mm. history of the abolitionist movement. And in fact, our anti-racism was based on what he and others knew and had worked out and had paid close attention to the abolitionist movement, which supported the slave uh, rebellion, which in fact um, Du Bois describes, I'm sure some of your listeners will know about Du Bois who really said there was a general strike of slaves and that's what won the civil war was the slaves won the civil war they just walked out the plantations and said take it and i'm going to join the union army and that was that was the end of their ability to govern mm. and he he spoke about that and uh, you know i was i think we were all absolutely dedicated to the education that we got as political people, as, and our minds were, were, I mean, were truly open to what popular movements, in this case, um, people who were slaves who decided not to be anymore, but it was always, it was always the movement of the grassroots, how they did it, how they dealt with defeat. That's another question. Mm. And I, I, this has dominated, I suppose you can see that, has dominated my life ever since. And I'm yeah. not exactly a young lady. Um, and this has been my interest. And I learned, I got my start with him. And we went beyond that, of course, because the movement of the 60s took us in another direction. But Johnson Forrest was our foundation. And we were dedicated to that organization. There were not many of us, there were about 70 of us, which is very small. It was multiracial because the Johnson was a man from Trinidad. Then there was the Russian woman, uh, Raya Donaevskaya. And then there was Grace Chin Lee, whose parents came from China. And she was the third person who was kind of the triumvirate who were mm. and just just organization. And just for people to understand that Johnson is, of course, that was the kind of, um, if you like, a kind of almost like a pseudonym for for C. L. R. James, and Forrest was a pseudonym for um, Dona Donayevskaya. Yes, Rea. So. Um, and in talking about the slaves and, uh, uh, you know, kind of like downing tools and saying we're not having it anymore, this is probably a good good point for us to kind of go into um, a little bit about the Black Jacobins, which, um, of course, is one of CLR James's most read uh, works. Um, <clears throat> and I do remember the first time I read it, I was possibly about 13 years old I was around 13 and it read to me like fiction like I kind of knew that it wasn't but it read which is what it's kind of like the point I was making earlier I really thought it was just like oh my god he wrote it he wrote it like a novel I, to my mind you know it was it was a detailed um informative story of strength and resistance, rebellion, defeat, you know, what you said just now about learning to organize, learning, you know, how we deal with defeat. And there was a lot, you know, we know that that, that Haitian, what people just talk, they talk about it, you know, sometimes people just kind of mention it, the Haitian revolution, as it was just this, it just happened, you know, like over the span of like a year, it was long and hard and bloody. And uh, I mean, what an amazing text. Can I have some of your um, kind of your feelings, your thoughts of like when you first read, read it? Uh, Ayanna lloyd Banwell, this uh, CLR James t-shirt. Um, you know, I'm actually just thinking. So I, 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 studied, I studied history at A-level, mm -hmm. um, but this Same. was, this was before CAPE was introduced. So this was, this was the Cambridge, a level that we did and and I remember 
this was, I mean, the Black Jacobins was not on our syllabus, right? So it was more the absence of it that I mm -hmm. found so interesting to think back on. It was not on our syllabus. Now, um, um, capitalism and slavery was, but I remember um, this was maybe by the time I got, I went to UWE and I continued studying um, history there also, thinking how much, how much easier, easier <laughs> the teaching would have been <laughs> if Black Jacobins was on our syllabus. Not just because of the approach, as you said, it's intensely readable, intensely um, interesting, but mm -hmm. I think um, it totally neutralized this idea that history is some sort of neutral sort of thing but you know you just put these facts together and then mm, they're objective mm. and you place them and you say oh well what do you think it's like no this what the you know the thing about the black jacobins that continues to to stir you know in me is that there is the idea of neutrality when it comes to injustice is ridiculous it's, it's not as ridiculous it is it is it is its injustice in its in itself and you know the writing of of this text is so something that i think we would take for granted now the idea that african people said no absolutely not this is not happening anymore we're not doing this anymore we're organizing we are you know what i mean and 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 this is something that i suppose you would take for granted today but certainly at the time this book was was written for him to put forward this premise of the idea of 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 resistance and revolution and organized strategic mm -hmm. revolution was probably even yeah. even more uh, more unheard of. Seemed it seemed fantastical, I think. Yeah, and um, um, certainly being eighteen and nineteen and studying um studying west indian history um i find it to be even more of a a, a crime now that, that 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 the black jacobins was not you know a, a main text <laughs> at the time yeah. um for for caribbean students to be examining a uh, uh, a period of of history that continues to be a kind of a blueprint for understanding the understanding the Caribbean relation to 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 the wider world it's you know I almost can't believe that it, it wasn't there I suppose I should say I can't believe that it was there we probably know yeah. why we, we are we know why well the the, the reasons their levels in terms of the reasons why um Selma your thoughts on uh, on the Black Jacobins and oh, and I found you know that same piece of paper that I was furiously writing notes on in in twenty thirteen. I uh, anyway, tell me tell me your feelings, and then I I, I wrote something that you said in twenty thirteen at, at the Oval. Um, but yeah, quote me so I don't contradict myself. Oh right, no no no. <laughs> <laughs> you um you said here, and I quote. He wrote it, the Black Jacobins, as a weapon in the struggle. Yes. That's what he said that's on Saturday, the 23rd of November, 2013. Yeah. That's, that's absolutely true. And it's not the only weapon, but it's certainly that he wrote. Mm -hmm. It is certainly the most effective weapon. You know, Haiti was so tremendous. Frederick Douglass, who was the great leader of the, of the abolitionist movement in the US who had been born a slave, um, he said, we colored people, I'm using his language, we colored people, none of us would be free now were it not for the Haitians. Yeah. You know, I, I'm just overwhelmed by that statement be, from, that, from that man who, really had been through it and they have been punished ever since yes and it has been our job to make sure that we support them and I just got a letter is it yesterday yesterday from Mrs Aristide Mildred Aristide um, 
President Aristide was one of the most extraordinary political leaders that I've known and even heard about. And his wife of Haitian descent is a fantastic woman who is modest beyond belief. She's the mother of two children who has, she has been raised in this melee of the American government and the French government and the, the um, Canadian government gouging the Haitian people and trying to repress them and trying to regain what they lost with the great revolution that mm. the Haitians made. And it, it is just an extraordinary experience for us to be in touch with those people. We, we've met them and we, uh, the campaign, the Wages for House for a campaign has been supporting them to the degree that we can all the time. They've built hospitals, they've built school. Look, he's just an extraordinary person. And he told me that when he was in exile in South Africa, that, um, what's his name? Tavo uh, Becky told him that when he read Black Jacobins, that's when he knew that they would beat the hell out of the whites and gain their, gain their rights. Yes. You know, the book has had that impact wherever it has been read. I mean, he, he does mention this, I think, in the maybe the prologue um, of the edition that I have, the Black Jacobin, C.L.R. James. He talks about, you know, how humbling it, it, it was for him to be kind of, you know, for people to kind of approach him and say how much the book has helped them in organizing, how much the book has helped them in, in, in regard to South Africans, you know, um, black South Africans in their relationship with those who were deemed, and they still sometimes call themselves as colored South Africans, you know, the mixed race South Africa, you know, that, that, that the black Jacobins was a kind of, um, yeah, it was, it was really a kind of tool that they used um, in sort right. of understanding and, and kind of exploring more deeply the relationships um, between those particular groups. Um, yeah, it continues to be, yeah. What, Margaret, yeah. I should bring you in here now. Black Jacobins. Yeah. Yeah, no, I'm fascinated listening to Ayanna and Selma, but I, I, I ought to say that I was, well, first of all, my connection with CLR goes back a long way, and it comes through my father, because my father was at school with CLR James, so, and they were friends for, you know, seven decades. And so the fact that most of CLR's books were out of print when I became a publisher in, in the late 60s, uh, and it was, it was extraordinary to me because I, I, I can't even remember when I first knew of him or his, read his books because they were part of my father's um, reading as well. But in the 70s, I decided as part of Alison and Busby to reissue a lot of the books. And we, we started by putting together some selected writings of CLRs. The first book was called The Future and the Present. And we also published a book that... Uh, had not been published before called Nkrumah and the Ghana Revolution in 1977. And it was, it, there were all sorts of connections being made because my father, although he'd grown up in Trinidad and had gone to the same school as CLR, Queen's Royal College, had won something called the Allen Scholarship, which meant that he could go abroad and have further education. Although, he, you know, he came from humble background, but he was bright and won the scholarship and studied medicine, in, in Ireland, factors in East London, and went to Ghana. And Padmore was also a friend of his. So all these connections were feeding into the fact that I wanted to make CLR's work available. And even Black Jacobins, this iconic, this masterpiece was out of print in the 70s. Yeah. And that was why I had to try and bring as many of CLR's works into print as possible. And Black Jacobins was published in the Asden Busby edition in 1980, I think, with a new forward by CLR James. But I think I think it's it's telling that it took so long for 
written, if you like, to catch up with what was so important about CLR's books, because I don't think he was out of print in America, but for the decade from 1977 to 1987, we published books, including Black Jacobins, including Notes on Dialects, including Mariners, Benedict and Castaways, things that should have been never out of print. So right. uh, I would love to hear more about what you thought. So, uh, you know, just, I don't, I don't know what era you were, you were stuck talking about, Diana, about not having those books in Trinidad, but it's, it's to me extraordinary that Trinidad should not have known and been teaching. The thing is, um, just, just to be clear, that A-level history syllabus, remember that's a British syllabus, huh? Mm -hmm. So when, when I did A-levels, we were still doing the Cambridge exams. So the syllabus was certainly not a West Indian or Caribbean developed history syllabus. I mean, we did, so how it was divided at the time, there was West Indian history, there was um, European history, there was American history, and you had to choose which two. So I think in, in my year, we did Caribbean history, West Indian history, and European history. But um, Black Jacobins was not a set text. And I didn't actually discover it until I was in, um, discovered for myself anyway, I mean, until I was in university. And it, it was, I, I went to, to UWE. So it was, of course, one of the books that I would have come across in UWE. And, um, you know, there, there's something, I just remember the first time I read it, it cracked me up so much. And it's, there's a part in Black Jacobins when he's describing um, he's describing the early sort of days of the revolution and and this was what this was the sort of the 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 the, the I want to use the word not vengeance the the, the justice that was dispensed <laughs> um, you know on 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 the colonists the planters etc and um, he says that um, they did in other words they didn't do they, they could have done worse and they didn't and that was almost like a camp. I wish I could remember. I wish I could remember the exact part. But the footnote is what I'm talking about. When he says, um, the footnote to that says, this statement has been criticized. The statement that, um, I, I mean, if I can remember, if I could remember the exact line I'm talking about. This statement has been criticized, but I stand by it. Mm. Right? In other words, what... The, the, the justice that was meted out to, on the plantations by the Africans in, in vengeance was nowhere close to the suffering that they had endured. It was nowhere, it, it paled in comparison. And mm -hmm. you know, there was a little footnote and it says, this statement has been criticized, but I stand by it. And I, I think I remember being in the library at Cackled, I sort of laughed out loud, and I said, "Damn right, stand by it." And you yeah. know, there was a there was a, a courage and a bravery for me at you know in my in my early twenties to be reading this book and 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 saying, "Yeah, you don't agree? Well, guess what? So and mm. and, and not just out of because it was true. It was true. It was I'm true. with you there. I'm, I'm like, I'm, yeah, it was true." Mm -hmm. it but was it, so but, true but it had to be said it, it had, had to, to be said, be said in yes. a book and defended mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. the thing about black jacob is from the first page he is with the slaves and that mm -hmm. was what made it different from the others there was no justice on the other side there was only justice in the slaves and there was only their act activity on their own behalf which freed them they were not freed by Lincoln or even by Toussaint Louverture they were freed by themselves mm -hmm. and um, that tradition remains in Haiti that is what we must support and make sure that people know what that struggle in Haiti is about and that is the struggle that all of us, all of us need to be involved in. Invested in, yes, I agree. Um, I'm a, very uh, aware that um, we're going to be, we finish it at, uh, oh my gosh, at 8.45. And it's just after half eight now. Away. And we have an international audience out there in 
online land. Is that what you say? No, what is it? Food trails, but I don't know, in online land. And um, I have a question. So there, there, I'm, I'm sure there are questions. I have a question from a lady called uh, Jocelyn Watson, and she asks, oh, says, something about Minty Ali, and she says, Minty Ali uniquely explores the plethora of issues that face women then and now without reaching any simple conclusions or simplistic characteristics. Do you think this is one of the major contributions of Minty Ali, particularly in the time when it was written? So issues that faced women then and face women now. Um, Jocelyn, thank you for that question, by the way. Thank you. Any takers with that in answering that? Do you think this is one of the major contributions of Minty Ali, particularly for the time that it was written? I think that he put the situation very boldly. And I think that once he's put it there, it's very hard to back away from the issues. So, yes. It's a contribution. I don't know right. if it's the major one, but it definitely counts. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I think I think I would I would agree with that. I don't know if it's the major one, but certainly, I mean, I think you can't. One of the things that 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 you can't get away from is is not only is he talking about the lives of women and so, but women and property, which I think remain mm -hmm. for me one of those, particularly in, 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 in my work that I'm looking at now, to have a character like Mrs. Rouse, who not only owns this space, but kind of doesn't also, because she's tied up with, with Benoit, who they, they, you know, she and her, 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 her partner who own this space together, um, which makes her quite um, vulnerable. Yeah. Vulnerable, exactly. Yeah, for sure. Exactly. Mm. And at the same time, there's also this space that is a communal in a lot of ways that is owned or or, or uh, even if not owned on paper, but certainly all of these lodgers have ownership and investment and so on in this in this space. So I, I find it also a very interesting um, novel for how it plays out the complicated um questions around ownership of property and ownership of land and homes for women mm. and and how um precarious that that ownership is and and even so and I, I think that's the part about Minty Ali that for me was always so interesting that that even um even as a as a homeowner she is still in that vulnerable kind of position and all of the people that surround her, the person who have the mortgage, the husband who's part owner, the other partner who could take it from her. There are all of these these things that are sort of beset Miss Rouse that, that make Minty Ali quite a precarious um, place for her. Mm, yes. I mean, it, it kind of, in rereading it, you know, especially, you know, that whole issue of, of the property and so on, um, I was kind of I was thinking about, you know, before certain laws came into place and you had people living together for years and years and years, you know, um, and then the man might die or whatever. And then the woman just had no say, no, no rights, you know, that's right. the, yeah, it's very. Um, and then even in, in you know, the, the character Mrs. Rouse also talks about the fact that her mother left her houses, her mother left her property, which then ended up being dispensed with and, and so on. So I think, um, again, you know, we sort of spoke about that very early in the ways that, that Minty Ali um, really dramatizes all of these issues around- Sociopolitical issues. Yes, yes, That remain yes. In, to, to some level, to some degree. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, any other questions from our international, all around the world audience? Um, while, while we wait for any of those questions to come up, I am conscious that we haven't really given any time yet to uh, Mariner's renegades and castaways um and we know um 
that this was well, some of us we know that that this um this work by CLR James was written um during the time of his incarceration on Ellis Island um and uh oh there are oh gosh and yeah there are questions I need to scroll down there are lots more um and this was written during oh gosh yes I have questions um Okay, can I, Thelma, can you tell us just very quickly a little bit about um, Mariners, Renegades and Castaways and CLR James's, you know, in terms of him being incarcerated there and, and really what he was trying to say. I know I'm asking a big question and asking you to, to, to kind of answer it in a, in a sort of capsule, but I'm aware now of, I'm seeing these other questions that have come up from yes. our yes. international um, audience. Okay. Mariners was written when he was on trial for to be deported. He wasn't deported then and he got out. But the book was sent to me um, to read and to comment about in the drop that he did on Ellis Island. Our relationship had not really fully happened when he was on Ellis Island. It really began when he got out. And he then he Grace Lee Grace Chin Lee and CLR and I worked together the three of us to get the book completely redone on the basis of the comments that I've made because I didn't know I was being used as a guinea pig which is I don't mean any offense and he wasn't treating me badly but I was to say what kind of a book should be written for an audience like people like me who are just a high school diploma and had never read um, literary criticism at all. And he wrote it and I typed it with Grace doing some editing and that's how the book got written. It was the case for him to stay in the United States. It has weaknesses, I think, because of that but it was his reading of one of the most important books in American literature, which he felt Americans had not understood. And he, as someone from away, a West Indian, with the experience that he had abroad, that he had, on, and because he was a committed socialist, he said, this book is about a factory on a ship destroying the environment. Mm -hmm. And I chose this book to make the analysis of the class relations between the monomaniac commander and the, 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 the seamen who had hardly had names. They were the unknown. Um, mm. and he said I claim my right to stay in the United States on the basis of my reading of the literature that you call your own that I think is world literature and that I think is an important contribution to human society thank you um we have three minutes left. We have uh, some questions. I'm going to just see, and oh gosh, the capsule answers that I'm now as chair going to demand of you. Um, Giorgio Riva is asking, in terms of organizing, can Selma say something about the school that CLR established for the grassroots? Selma, you're on a timer. You have seconds. Give well, us what you've got. Well, um, uh, very briefly, we really do need more time for this discussion. Anyway, very briefly, those of us who were the grassroots were told to come to a school where the leadership would attend and they would discuss with us and learn from us what we thought about various issues. It was called the school for the third layer, third layer meeting. The first layer is the top leadership. The second layer is the second in command. And then there's the rest of us, most of the world. 
And I was one of the people who was uh, suggested um, be part of one of the schools. There were two schools running at the same time with two separate parts of uh, two leaders in each. Uh, that's all there's time to discuss. Okay, yes, yeah. just discuss, but not now. Yeah, we have one minute left. Somebody was asking about uh, Anthony Harding was asking what was CLR James's secret because he was obviously committed and successful both as a writer and an organizer and what was his secret and I kind of want to feel Selma that you have in a way answered that before because you spoke about his great interest and his engagement and the fact that he was a listener the fact that he was a great observer and that he took those things on board he took what mattered to people on board and that leadership for him was about you know finding out where people wanted to go and getting them there um and so anthony i hope I mean, that in part kind of um, answers um, uh, uh, helping them to go there not getting them there but helping them helping yeah that working with them also want to go if you don't want to go to the same place get out of that organization good yeah like it i like it ladies wonderful women it is now 2045. I cannot believe the time has whizzed by. But we must thank Margaret Busby for publishing <laughs> this. Book. Margaret I Busby, thank you for this publishing. Is a great contribution, which I will never stop thanking you for oh, doing. Thank you, Selma. But it was such a privilege to be able to do that. And it's a privilege to be on this panel with you and with Ayana oh and with gosh. you, Nicole Michelle. I don't know how I got the gig. I can't, I can't believe it. <laughs> Like life, does it get better? Does it get better in terms oh of the literary gigs? We, we really James. needed the whole day to do this discussion. Definitely. <laughs> Selma James, Margaret Busby, Ayanna lloyd Banwell. I want to thank you all so much. I'm going to pass back to Molly. Molly, are you there? And will you yeah. uh, wrap us up? <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you so much. Well, it's my turn to thank you so much, Nicole, Rochelle, Margaret, Ayanna, and Selma. If this evening's discussion has inspired you to read or rediscover CLR James as much as it has me, uh, you can buy your copies of his books from the British Library shop. Yes, beautifully demonstrated, Ayana. Beautiful, beautiful. Um, or if you uh, go to the RSL's bookshop.org page, you can find books by our speakers, our wonderful, brilliant speakers uh, this evening, as well as CLR James's books, while supporting independent bookshops as you shop. Um, yes. <laughs> I'd like to thank our partners at the British Library for hosting this evening and the team at Unique Media for broadcasting this conversation to all of us across the world. Thanks too to the teams at Curtis Brown Heritage and NGC Bocas Litfest for all their work uh, in bringing tonight's discussion together. And I know that there's another CLR James event coming up soon with Bocas, so please look that up and join us all for that, uh, I think, next week as well. Uh, you can also join the RSL, the Royal Society of Literature, again next Tuesday for a special event with Bernadine Everisto and Britt Bennett in the first of the RSL's partnered transatlantic conversations co-hosted with New York Public Library. All tickets for that event are free uh, and online and you can book through the RSL website or find links through our social media. After that, you can join us uh, again in person or online with the British Library on the 17th of May to hear Armando Iannucci and Marina Hyde in conversation about writing and translating the news. You can attend all RSL events uh, for free with a free ticket by becoming an RSL member or digital events pass holder. Our memberships and passes start at £25 a year and anyone can join today. So just go to rsliterature.org to buy your membership now and get one of the last tickets to Armando Iannucci uh, and Marina Hyde particularly. I hope that we'll see you uh, next week, but until then, I'd like to lead off a final huge thanks to our speakers this evening for such a wonderful, deep and interesting conversation. Uh, thank you all so much and good night to everyone watching at home.